the Loch Ness Monster, Scottish Gaelic, Bolebius Loch Ness, affectionately known as Nessie, is a creature in Scottish folklore that is said to inhabit Loch Ness in the Scottish Highlands. It is often described as large, long-necked, and with one or more humps protruding from the water. Popular interest and belief in the creature has varied since it was brought to worldwide attention in 1933. Evidence of its existence is anecdotal, with a number of disputed photographs and sonar readings. The scientific community explains alleged sightings of the Loch Ness Monster as hoaxes, wishful thinking, and the misidentification of mundane objects. The pseudoscience and subculture of cryptozoology has placed particular emphasis on the creature. In August 1933, The Courier published the account of George Spicer's alleged sighting. Public interest skyrocketed, with countless letters being sent in detailing different sightings describing a monster fish, sea serpent, or dragon, with the final name ultimately settling on Loch Ness Monster. Since the 1940s, the creature has been affectionately called Nessie, Scottish Gaelic, Nizig. The earliest report of a monster in the vicinity of Loch Ness appears in the life of St. Columbo by Adamnan, written in the 6th century AD. According to Adamnan, writing about a century after the events described, Irish monk St. Columbo was staying in the land of the Picts with his companions when he encountered local residents burying a man by the river Ness. They explained that the man was swimming in the river when he was attacked by a water beast that mauled him and dragged him underwater despite their attempts to rescue him by boat. Columbus sent a follower, Luigni Makumin, to swim across the river. The beast approached him, but Columbo made the sign of the cross and said, Go no further. Do not touch the man. Go back at once. The creature stopped as if it had been pulled back with ropes and fled, and Columbus' men and the pigs gave thanks for what they perceived as a miracle. Believers in the monster point to this story, set in the river Ness rather than the lock itself, as evidence for the creature's existence as early as the 6th century. Skeptics question the narrative's reliability, noting that water beast stories were extremely common in medieval hagiographies, and Adamnan's tale probably recycles a common motif attached to a local landmark. According to skeptics, Adamnan's story may be independent of the modern Loch Ness monster legend and became attached to it by believers seeking to bolster their claims. Ronald Benz considers that this is the most serious of various alleged early sightings of the monster, but all other claimed sightings before 1933 are dubious and do not prove a monster tradition before that date. Christopher Kearney uses a specific historical and cultural analysis of Adamnan to separate Adamnan's story about St. Columbo from the modern myth of the Loch Ness Monster, but finds an earlier and culturally significant use of Celtic water beast folklore along the way. In doing so he also discredits any strong connection between Kelpies or water horses and the modern media augmented creation of the Loch Ness Monster. He also concludes that the story of Saint Columbo may have been impacted by earlier Irish myths about the Caturanich and an oil Lafayette. In October 1871, or 1872, 
D. Mackenzie of Balnain reportedly saw an object resembling a log or an upturned boat wriggling and churning up the water, moving slowly at first before disappearing at a faster speed. The account was not published until 1934, when Mackenzie sent his story in a letter to Rupert Gould shortly after popular interest in the monster increased. In 1888, Mason Alexander MacDonald of Avriakan sighted a large stubby-legged animal surfacing from the lock and propelling itself within 50 yards of the shore where MacDonald stood. MacDonald reported his sighting to Loch Ness Water Bailiff Alex Campbell, and described the creature as looking like a salamander. The best-known article that first attracted a great deal of attention about a creature was published on May 2, 1933 in the Inverness Courier, about a large beast or whale-like fish. The article by Alex Campbell, water bailiff for Loch Ness and a part-time journalist discussed a sighting by Aldi McKay of an enormous creature with the body of a whale rolling in the water in the loch while she and her husband John were driving on the A82 on April 15, 1933. The word monster was reportedly applied for the first time in Camel's article, although some reports claim that it was coined by editor Evan Barron. The Courier in 2017 published excerpts from the Campbell article, which had been titled Strange Spectacle in Loch Ness. The creature disp or itself, rolling and plunging for fully a minute, its body resembling that of a whale, and the water cascading and churning like a simmering cauldron. Soon, however, it disappeared in a boiling mass of foam. Both onlookers confessed that there was something uncanny about the whole thing, for they realized that here was no ordinary denizen of the depths, because, apart from its enormous size, the beast, in taking the final plunge, sent out waves that were big enough to have been caused by a passing steamer. According to a 2013 article, McKay said that she had yelled, Stop! The Beast, when viewing the spectacle. In the late 1980s, a naturalist interviewed Aldi McKay and she admitted to knowing that there had been an oral tradition of a beast in the lock well before her claimed sighting. Alex Camel's 1933 article also stated that Loch Ness has for generations been credited with being the home of a fearsome looking monster. Modern interest in the monster was sparked by a sighting on July 22, 1933, when George Spicer and his wife saw a most extraordinary form of animal cross the road in front of their car. They described the creature as having a large body, about 4 feet, 1.2 m, high and 25 feet, 8 m, long and a long, wavy, narrow neck, slightly thicker than an elephant's trunk and as long as the 10, 12 foot, 3 to 4 m, width of the road. They saw no limbs. It lurched across the road toward the lock 20 yards, 20 m, away, leaving a trail of broken undergrowth in its wake. Spicer described it as the nearest approach to a dragon or prehistoric animal that I have ever seen in my life, and as having a long neck, which moved up and down in the manner of a scenic railway. It had an animal in its mouth and had a body that was fairly big, with a high back, but if there were any feet they must have been of the web kind, and as for a tail I cannot say, as it moved so rapidly, 
and when we got to the spot it had probably disappeared into the lock. On August 4, 1933 the Courier published a report of Spicer sighting. This sighting triggered a massive amount of public interest and an uptick in alleged sightings, leading to the solidification of the actual name Loch Ness Monster. It has been claimed that sightings of the monster increased after a road was built along the lock in early 1933, bringing workers and tourists to the formerly isolated area. However, Benz has described this as the myth of the lonely lock, as it was far from isolated before then, due to the construction of the Caledonian Canal. In the 1930s, the existing road by the side of the lock was given a serious upgrade. Hugh Gray's photograph taken near Foyers on November 12, 1933 was the first photograph alleged to depict the monster. It was slightly blurred, and it has been noted that if one looks closely the head of a dog can be seen. Gray had taken his Labrador for a walk that day and it is suspected that the photograph depicts his dog fetching a stick from the lock. Others have suggested that the photograph depicts an otter or a swan. The original negative was lost. However, in 1963, Maurice Burton came into possession of two lantern slides, contact positives from the original negative and when projected onto a screen they revealed an otter rolling at the surface in characteristic fashion. On the 5th of January 1934, a motorcyclist, Arthur Grant, claimed to have nearly hit the creature while approaching Abraikan, near the northeastern end of the lock, at about 1 a.m. on a moonlit night. According to Grant, it had a small head attached to a long neck, the creature saw him, and crossed the road back to the lock. Grant, a veterinary student, described it as a cross between a seal and a plesiosaur. He said he dismounted and followed it to the lock, but saw only ripples. Grant produced a sketch of the creature that was examined by zoologist Maurice Burton, who stated it was consistent with the appearance and behavior of an otter. Regarding the long size of the creature reported by Grant, it has been suggested that this was a faulty observation due to the poor light conditions. Paleontologist Darren Naish has suggested that Grant may have seen either an otter or a seal and exaggerated his sighting over time. The surgeon's photograph is reportedly the first photo of the creature's head and neck. Supposedly taken by Robert Kenneth Wilson, a London gynecologist, it was published in the Daily Mail on April 21, 1934. Wilson's refusal to have his name associated with it led to it being known as the surgeon's photograph. According to Wilson, he was looking at the lock when he saw the monster, grabbed his camera and snapped four photos. Only two exposures came out clearly, the first reportedly shows a small head and back, and the second shows a similar head in a diving position. The first photo became well known, and the second attracted little publicity because of its blurriness. For 60 years the photo was considered evidence of the monster's existence, although skeptics dismissed it as driftwood, an elephant, an otter, or a bird. The photo's scale was controversial, it is often shown cropped, making the creature seem large and the ripples like waves, while the uncropped shot shows the other end of the lock and the monster in the center. 
the ripples in the photo were found to fit the size and pattern of small ripples, rather than large waves photographed up close. Analysis of the original image fostered further doubt. In 1993, the makers of the Discovery Communications documentary Loch Ness discovered analyzed the uncropped image and found a white object visible in every version of the photo, implying that it was on the negative. It was believed to be the cause of the ripples, as if the object was being towed, although the possibility of a blemish on the negative could not be ruled out. An analysis of the full photograph indicated that the object was small, about 60 to 90 centimeters, 2 to 3 feet, long. Since 1994, most agree that the photo was an elaborate hoax. It had been described as fake in a December 7th. 1975 Sunday Telegraph article that fell into obscurity. Details of how the photo was taken were published in the 1999 book, Nessie, The Surgeon's Photograph Exposed, which contains a facsimile of the 1975 Sunday Telegraph article. The creature was reportedly a toy submarine built by Christian Sperling, the son-in-law of Marmaduke Wetherell. Wetherell had been publicly ridiculed by his employer, the Daily Mail, after he found Nessie footprints that turned out to be a hoax. To get revenge on the Mail, Wetherell perpetrated his hoax with co-conspirators Sperling, sculpture specialist, Ian Wetherell, his son, who bought the material for the fake, and Maurice Chambers, an insurance agent. The toy submarine was bought from F.W. Woolworths, and its head and neck were made from wood putty. After testing it in a local pond the group went to Loch Ness, where Ian Wetherell took the photos near the outside tea house. When they heard a water bailiff approaching, Duke Wetherell sank the model with his foot and it is presumably still somewhere in Loch Ness. Chambers gave the photographic plates to Wilson, a friend of his who enjoyed a good practical joke. Wilson brought the plates to Ogston's, an Inverness chemist, and gave them to George Morrison for development. He sold the first photo to the Daily Mail, who then announced that the monster had been photographed. Little is known of the second photo, it is often ignored by researchers, who believe its quality too poor and its differences from the first photo too great to warrant analysis. It shows a head similar to the first photo, with a more turbulent wave pattern, and possibly taken at a different time and location in the lock. Some believe it to be an earlier, cruder attempt at a hoax, and others, including Roy McCall and Maurice Burton, consider it a picture of a diving bird or otter that Wilson mistook for the monster. According to Morrison, when the plates were developed, Wilson was uninterested in the second photo, he allowed Morrison to keep the negative, and the photo was rediscovered years later. When asked about the second photo by the Ness Information Service newsletter, Sperling, was vague, thought it might have been a piece of wood they were trying out as a monster, but was not sure. On May 29, 1938, South African tourist G. E. Taylor filmed something in the lock for three minutes on 16mm color film. The film was obtained by popular science writer Maurice Burton, who did not show it to other researchers. 
A single frame was published in his 1961 book, The Elusive Monster. His analysis concluded it was a floating object, not an animal. On August 15, 1938, William Fraser, chief constable of Inverness Shire, wrote a letter that the monster existed beyond doubt and expressed concern about a hunting party that had arrived, with a custom-made harpoon gun, determined to catch the monster dead or alive. He believed his power to protect the monster from the hunters was very doubtful. The letter was released by the National Archives of Scotland on April 27, 2010. In December 1954, sonar readings were taken by the fishing boat Rival 3. Its crew noted a large object keeping pace with the vessel at a depth of 146 meters, 479 feet. It was detected for 800 minutes, 2,600 feet, before contact was lost and regained previous sonar attempts were inconclusive or negative. Peter McNabb at Urquhart Castle on July 29, 1955 took a photograph that depicted two long black humps in the water. The photograph was not made public until it appeared in Constance White's 1957 book on the subject. On October 23, 1958 it was published by the Weekly Scotsman. Author Ronald Binns wrote that the phenomenon which McNabb photographed could easily be a wave effect resulting from three trawlers traveling closely together up the lock. Other researchers consider the photograph a hoax. Roy McCall requested to use the photograph in his 1976 book. He received the original negative from McNabb, but discovered it differed from the photograph that appeared in White's book. The tree at the bottom left in White's was missing from the negative. It is suspected that the photograph was doctored by re-photographing a print. Aeronautical engineer Tim Dinsdale filmed a hump that left a wake crossing Loch Ness in 1960. Dinsdale, who reportedly had the sighting on his final day of search, described it as reddish with a blotch on its side. He said that when he mounted his camera the object began to move, and he shot 40 feet of film. According to Jarek, the object was probably animate. Others were skeptical, saying that the hump cannot be ruled out as being a boat and when the contrast is increased, a man in a boat can be seen. In 1993 Discovery Communications produced a documentary, Loch Ness Discovered, with a digital enhancement of the Dinsdale film. A person who enhanced the film noticed a shadow in the negative that was not obvious in the developed film. By enhancing and overlaying frames, he found what appeared to be the rear body of a creature underwater, before I saw the film, I thought the Loch Ness Monster was a load of rubbish. Having done the enhancement, I'm not so sure. On May 21, 1977 Anthony Doc Shields, camping next to Urquhart Castle, took some of the clearest pictures of the monster until this day. Shields, a magician, and psychic, claimed to have summoned the animal out of the water. He later described it as an elephant squid, claiming the long neck shown in the photograph is actually the squid's trunk and that a white spot at the base of the neck is its eye. Due to the lack of ripples, it has been declared a hoax by a number of people and received its name because of its staged look. 
On May 26, 2007, 55-year-old laboratory technician Gordon Holmes videotaped what he said was this jet black thing, about 14 meters, 46 feet, long, moving fairly fast in the water. Adrian Shine, a marine biologist at the Loch Ness 2000 Center in Drumadrakit, described the footage as among the best footage he had ever seen. BBC Scotland broadcast the video on May 29, 2007. STV News North Tonight aired the footage on May 28, 2007 and interviewed Holmes. Shine was also interviewed, and suggested that the footage was an otter, seal, or water bird. On August 24, 2011 Loch Ness boat captain Marcus Atkinson photographed a sonar image of a 1.5 meter wide, 4.9 feet, unidentified object that seemed to follow his boat for two minutes at a depth of 23 meters 75 feet, and ruled out the possibility of a small fish or seal. In April 2012, a scientist from the National Oceanography Center said that the image is a bloom of algae and zooplankton. On August 3, 2012, skipper George Edwards claimed that a photo he took on November 2, 2011 shows Nessie. Edwards claims to have searched for the monster for 26 years, and reportedly spent 60 hours per week on the lock aboard his boat, Nessie Hunter 4, taking tourists for rides on the Lake 65 Edwards said, in my opinion, it probably looks kind of like a manatee, but not a mammal. When people see three humps, they're probably just seeing three separate monsters. Other researchers have questioned the photograph's authenticity, and Loch Ness researcher Steve Feltham suggested that the object in the water is a fiberglass hump used in a National Geographic Channel documentary in which Edwards had participated. Researcher Dick Rayner has questioned Edwards' claim of discovering a deeper bottom of Loch Ness, which Rayner calls Edwards' deep. He found inconsistencies between Edwards' claims for the location and conditions of the photograph and the actual location and weather conditions that day. According to Rayner, Edwards told him he had faked a photograph in 1986 that he claimed was genuine in the Nat Geo documentary. Although Edwards admitted in October 2013 that his 2011 photograph was a hoax, he insisted that the 1986 photograph was genuine. A survey of the literature about other hoaxes, including photographs, published by the Scientific American on July 10, 2013, indicates many others since the 1930s. The most recent photo considered to be good appeared in newspapers in August 2012, it was allegedly taken by George Edwards in November 2011 but was definitely a hoax according to the Science Journal. On August 27, 2013, tourist David Elder presented a five-minute video of a mysterious wave in the lock. According to Elder, the wave was produced by a 4.5 meters 15 feet solid black object just under the surface of the water. Elder, 50, from East Kilbride, South Lanarkshire, was taking a picture of a swan at the Fort Augustus Pier on the southwestern end of the lock, when he captured the movement. He said, 
the water was very still at the time and there were no ripples coming off the wave and no other activity on the water. Septics suggested that the wave may have been caused by a wind gust. On April 19, 2014, it was reported that a satellite image on Apple Maps showed what appeared to be a large creature, thought by some to be the Loch Ness Monster, just below the surface of Loch Ness. At the locks far north, the image appeared about 30 meters, 98 feet, long. Possible explanations were the wake of a boat, with the boat itself lost in image stitching or low contrast, seal caused ripples, or floating wood. Google commemorated the 81st anniversary of the surgeon's photograph with a Google Doodle, and added a new feature to Google Street View with which users can explore the lock above and below the water. Google reportedly spent a week at Loch Ness collecting imagery with a Street View Trekker camera, attaching it to a boat to photograph above the surface and collaborating with members of the Catlin Sea View Survey to photograph underwater. After reading Rupert Gould's The Loch Ness Monster and others, Edward Mountain financed a search. Twenty men with binoculars and cameras positioned themselves around the lock from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. for five weeks, beginning on July 13, 1934. Although 21 photographs were taken, none was considered conclusive. Supervisor James Fraser remained by the lock filming on September 15, 1934, the film is now lost. Zoologists and professors of natural history concluded that the film showed a seal, possibly a grey seal. The Loch Ness Phenomena Investigation Bureau LPIB, was a UK-based society formed in 1962 by Norman Collins, RSR Fitter, politician David James, Peter Scott, and Constance White to study Loch Ness to identify the creature known as the Loch Ness Monster or determine the causes of reports of it. In 1967 it received a grant of $20,000 from World Book Encyclopedia to fund a two-year program of daylight watches from May to October. The principal equipment was 35mm movie cameras on mobile units with 20-inch lenses, and one with a 36-inch lens at Aknahanet, near the midpoint of the lock. With the mobile units in Labies about 80% of the lock surface was covered. The society's name was later shortened to the Loch Ness Investigation Bureau LNIB, and it disbanded in 1972. The LNIB had an annual subscription charge, which covered administration. Its main activity was encouraging groups of self-funded volunteers to watch the lock from vantage points with film cameras with telescopic lenses. From 1965 to 1972 it had a caravan camp and viewing platform at Aknahanet, and sent observers to other locations up and down the lock. According to the Bureau's 1969 annual report it had 1,030 members, of whom 588 were from the UK. D. Gordon Tucker, Chair of the Department of Electronic and Electrical Engineering at the University of Birmingham, volunteered his services as a sonar developer and expert at Loch Ness in 1968. His gesture, part of a larger effort led by the LMBIB from 1967 to 1968, involved collaboration between volunteers and professionals in a number of fields. 
Tucker had chosen Loch Ness as the test site for a prototype sonar transducer with a maximum range of 800 meters 2,600 feet. The device was fixed underwater at Temple Pier in Urquhar Bay and directed at the opposite shore, drawing an acoustic net across the lock through which no moving object could pass undetected. During the two-week trial in August, multiple targets were identified. One was probably a shoal of fish, but others moved in a way not typical of shoals at speeds up to 10 knots. In 1972, a group of researchers from the Academy of Applied Science led by Robert H. Rines conducted a search for the monster involving sonar examination of the lock depths for unusual activity. Rines took precautions to avoid murky water with floating wood and peat citation needed a submersible camera with a floodlight was deployed to record images below the surface. If Rhines detected anything on the sonar, he turned the light on and took pictures. On August 8, Rhines Raytheon de 725C sonar unit, operating at a frequency of 200 kHz and anchored at a depth of 11 meters, 36 feet, identified a moving target, or targets, estimated by echo strength at 6 to 9 meters, 20 to 30 feet, in length. Specialists from Raytheon, Simrad, now Kongsberg Maritime, Hydroacoustics, Marty Klein of MIT and Klein Associates, a side-scan sonar producer, and IRA Dyer of MIT's Department of Ocean Engineering were on hand to examine the data. P. Skitsky of Raytheon suggested that the data indicated a 3-meter protuberance projecting from one of the echoes. According to author Roy McCall, the shape was a highly flexible laterally flattened tail or the misinterpreted return from two animals swimming together. Concurrent with the sonar readings, the floodlit camera obtained a pair of underwater photographs. Both depicted what appeared to be a rhomboid flipper, although septics have dismissed the images as depicting the bottom of the lock, air bubbles, a rock, or a fish fin. The apparent flipper was photographed in different positions, indicating movement. The first flipper photo is better known than the second, and both were enhanced and retouched from the original negatives. According to team member Charles Wyckoff, the photos were retouched to superimpose the flipper, the original enhancement showed a considerably less distinct object. No one is sure how the originals were altered. During a meeting with Tony Harmsworth and Adrian Schein at the Loch Ness Center and Exhibition, Rhines admitted that the flipper photo may have been retouched by a magazine editor. British naturalist Peter Scott announced in 1975, on the basis of the photographs, that the creature's scientific name would be Nesideras rhombopteryx, Greek for Ness inhabitant with diamond-shaped fin. Scott intended that the name would enable the creature to be added to the British Register of Protected Wildlife. Scottish politician Nicholas Fairbairn called the name an anagram for monster hoax by Sir Peter S. However, Rhines countered that when rearranged, the letters could also spell yes, both pigs are monsters, R. Another sonar contact was made, this time with two objects estimated to be about 9 meters, 30 feet. The strobe camera photographed two large objects surrounded by a flurry of bubbles. 
Some interpreted the objects as two plesiosaur-like animals, suggesting several large animals living in Loch Ness. This photograph has rarely been published. A second search was conducted by Rhines in 1975. Some of the photographs, despite their obviously murky quality and lack of concurrent sonar readings, did indeed seem to show unknown animals in various positions and lightings. One photograph appeared to show the head, neck, and upper torso of a plesiosaur-like animal, but septics argue the object is a log due to the lump on its chest area, the mass of sediment in the full photo, and the object's log-like skin texture. Another photograph seemed to depict a horned gargoyle head, consistent with that of some sightings of the monster, however, septics point out that a tree stump was later filmed during Operation Deep Scan in 1987, which bore a striking resemblance to the gargoyle head. In 2001, Rhine's Academy of Applied Science videotaped a V-shaped wake traversing still water on a calm day. The Academy also videotaped an object on the floor of the lock resembling a carcass and found marine clamshells and a fungus-like organism not normally found in freshwater locks, a suggested connection to the sea and a possible entry for the creature. In 2008, Rhines theorized that the creature may have become extinct, citing the lack of significant sonar readings and a decline in eyewitness accounts. He undertook a final expedition, using sonar and an underwater camera in an attempt to find a carcass. Rhines believed that the animals may have failed to adapt to temperature changes resulting from global warming. Operation Deep Scan was conducted in 1987. 24 boats equipped with echo sounding equipment were deployed across the width of the lock, and simultaneously sent acoustic waves. According to BBC News the scientists had made sonar contact with an unidentified object of unusual size and strength. The researchers returned, rescanning the area. Analysis of the echo sounder images seemed to indicate debris at the bottom of the lock, although there was motion in three of the pictures. Adrian Schein speculated, based on size, that they might be seals that had entered the lock. Sonar expert Daryl Lawrence, founder of Lawrence Electronics, donated a number of echo sounder units used in the operation. After examining a sonar return indicating a large, moving object at a depth of 180 meters, 590 feet, Near Urquhart Bay, Lawrence said, there's something here that we don't understand, and there's something here that's larger than a fish, maybe some species that hasn't been detected before. I don't know. In 2003, the BBC sponsored a search of the lock using 600 sonar beams and satellite tracking. The search had sufficient resolution to identify a small buoy. No animal of substantial size was found and, despite their reported hopes, the scientists involved admitted that this proved the Loch Ness Monster was a myth. Searching for the Loch Ness Monster aired on BBC One. An international team consisting of researchers from the universities of Otago, Copenhagen, Hull, and the Highlands and Islands, did a DNA survey of the lake in June 2018, looking for unusual species. The results were published in 2019, 
no DNA of large fish such as sharks, sturgeons, and catfish could be found. No otter or seal DNA were obtained either, though there was a lot of eel DNA. The leader of the study, Professor Neil Gemmel of the University of Otago, said he could not rule out the possibility of eels of extreme size, though none were found, nor were any ever caught. The other possibility is that the large amount of eel DNA simply comes from many small eels. No evidence of any reptilian sequences were found, he added, so I think we can be fairly sure that there is probably not a giant scaly reptile swimming around in Loch Ness, he said. A number of explanations have been suggested to account for sightings of the creature. According to Ronald Binns, a former member of the Loch Ness Phenomena Investigation Bureau, there is probably no single explanation of the monster. Binns wrote two sceptical books, the 1983 The Loch Ness Mystery Solved, and his 2017 The Loch Ness Mystery Reloaded. In these he contends that an aspect of human psychology is the ability of the eye to see what it wants, and expects, to see. They may be categorized as misidentifications of known animals, misidentifications of inanimate objects or effects, reinterpretations of Scottish folklore, hoaxes, and exotic species of large animals. A reviewer wrote that Benz had evolved into the author of the definitive, skeptical book on the subject. Benz does not call the sightings a hoax, but a myth in the true sense of the term and states that the monster is a sociological, phenomenon. After 1983 the search for the possibility that there just might be continues to enthrall a small number for whom eyewitness evidence outweighs all other considerations. Wakes have been reported when the lock is calm, with no boats nearby. Bartender David Monroe reported a wake he believed was a creature zigzagging, diving, and reappearing. There were reportedly 26 other witnesses from a nearby car park. Although some sightings describe a V-shaped wake similar to a boat's, others report something not conforming to the shape of a boat. A large eel was an early suggestion for what the monster was. Eels are found in Loch Ness, and an unusually large one would explain many sightings. Dinsdale dismissed the hypothesis because eels undulate side to side like snakes. Sightings in 1856 of a sea serpent, or kelpie, in a freshwater lake near Lerbost in the Outer Hebrides were explained as those of an oversized eel also believed common in highland lakes. From 2018 to 2019, scientists from New Zealand undertook a massive project to document every organism in Loch Ness based on DNA samples. Their reports confirmed that European eels are still found in the loch. No DNA samples were found for large animals such as catfish, Greenland sharks, or plesiosaurs. Many scientists now believe that giant eels account for many, if not most of the sightings. In a 1979 article, California biologist Dennis Power and geographer Donald Johnson claimed that the surgeon's photograph was the top of the head, extended trunk, and flared nostrils of a swimming elephant photographed elsewhere and claimed to be from Loch Ness. In 2006, 
paleontologist and artist Neil Clark suggested that traveling circuses might have allowed elephants to bathe in the lock, the trunk could be the perceived head and neck, with the head and back the perceived humps. In support of this, Clark provided an example painting. Zoologist, angler, and television presenter Jeremy Wade investigated the creature in 2013 as part of the series River Monsters, and concluded that it is a Greenland shark. The Greenland shark, which can reach up to 20 feet in length, inhabits the North Atlantic Ocean around Canada, Greenland, Iceland, Norway, and possibly Scotland. It is dark in color, with a small dorsal fin. According to biologist Bruce Wright, the Greenland shark could survive in fresh water, possibly using rivers and lakes to find food, and Loch Ness has an abundance of salmon and other fish. In July 2015 three news outlets reported that Steve Feltham, after a vigil at the lock that was recognized by the Guinness Book of Records, theorized that the monster is an unusually large specimen of Wells catfish, Silurus glanis, which may have been released during the late 19th century. It is difficult to judge the size of an object in water through a telescope or binoculars with no external reference. Loch Ness has resident otters, and photos of them and deer swimming in the loch, which were cited by author Ronald Binns may have been misinterpreted. According to Binns, birds may be mistaken for a head and neck sighting. In 1933, the Daily Mirror published a picture with the caption, This queerly shaped tree trunk, washed ashore at foyers on Loch Ness may, it is thought, be responsible for the reported appearance of a monster. In a 1982 series of articles for New Scientist, Maurice Burton proposed that sightings of Nessie and similar creatures may be fermenting Scots pine logs rising to the surface of the loch. A decomposing log could not initially release gases caused by decay because of its high resin level. Gas pressure would eventually rupture a resin seal at one end of the log, propelling it through the water sometimes to the surface. According to Burton, the shape of tree logs, with their branch stumps, closely resembles descriptions of the monster. Loch Ness, because of its long, straight shape, is subject to unusual ripples affecting its surface. A seiche is a large oscillation of a lake, caused by water reverting to its natural level after being blown to one end of the lake, resulting in a standing wave, the Loch Ness oscillation period is 31.5 minutes. Earthquakes in Scotland are too weak to cause observable seiches, but extremely massive earthquakes far away could cause large waves. The seiche created in Loch Ness by the catastrophic 1755 Lisbon earthquake was reportedly so violent as to threaten destruction to some houses built on the sides of it, while the 1761 aftershock caused 2 foot 60 centimeters, waves. However, no sightings of the monster were reported in 1755. Wind conditions can give a choppy, matte appearance to the water with calm patches appearing dark from the shore, reflecting the mountains. In 1979 W.H. Lane showed that atmospheric refraction could distort the shape and size of objects and animals, 
and later published a photograph of a mirage of a rock on Lake Winnipeg that resembled a head and neck. Italian geologist Luigi Picardi has proposed geological explanations for ancient legends and myths. Picardi noted that in the earliest recorded sighting of a creature, the life of Saint Columba, the creature's emergence was accompanied cum ingenti frematu, with loud roaring. The Loch Ness is along the Great Glen Fault, and this could be a description of an earthquake. Many reports consist only of a large disturbance on the surface of the water, this could be a release of gas through the fault, although it may be mistaken for something swimming below the surface. In 1980 Swedish naturalist and author Bengt Chagrin wrote that present beliefs in lake monsters such as the Loch Ness Monster are associated with Kelpie legends. According to Chagrin, accounts of Loch Monsters have changed over time, originally describing horse-like creatures, they were intended to keep children away from the Loch. Chagrin wrote that the Kelpie legends have developed into descriptions reflecting a modern awareness of plesiosaurs. The Kelpie as a water horse in Loch Ness was mentioned in an 1879 Scottish newspaper, and inspired Tim Dinsdale's project Water Horse. A study of pre-1933 Highland folklore references to Kelpies, water horses and water bulls indicated that Ness was the lock most frequently sighted. A number of hoax attempts have been made, some of which were successful. Other hoaxes were revealed rather quickly by the perpetrators or exposed after diligent research. A few examples follow. In August 1933, Italian journalist Francesco Gasparini submitted what he said was the first news article on the Loch Ness Monster. In 1959, he reported citing a strange fish and fabricated eyewitness accounts, I had the inspiration to get hold of the item about the strange fish. The idea of the monster had never dawned on me, but then I noted that the strange fish would not yield a long article, and I decided to promote the imaginary being to the rank of monster without further ado. In the 1930s, big game hunter Marmaduke Wetherell went to Loch Ness to look for the monster. Wetherell claimed to have found footprints, but when casts of the footprints were sent to scientists for analysis they turned out to be from a hippopotamus, a prankster had used a hippopotamus foot umbrella stand. In 1972 a team of zoologists from Yorkshire's Flamingo Park Zoo, searching for the monster, discovered a large body floating in the water. The corpse, 4.9 to 5.4 m, 16 to 18 feet, long and weighing as much as 1.5 tons, was described by the Press Association as having a bear's head and a brown scaly body with claw-like fins. The creature was placed in a van to be carried away for testing, but police seized the cadaver under an act of parliament prohibiting the removal of unidentified creatures from Loch Ness. It was later revealed that Flamingo Park Education Officer John Shields shaved the whiskers and otherwise disfigured a bull elephant seal that had died the week before and dumped it in Loch Ness to dupe his colleagues. On July 2, 2003, Gerald McSorley discovered a fossil, supposedly from the creature, when he tripped and fell into the lock. After examination, it was clear that the fossil had been planted. In 2004 a 5TV documentary team, 
using cinematic special effects experts, tried to convince people that there was something in the lock. They constructed an animatronic model of a plesiosaur, calling it Lucy. Despite setbacks, including Lucy falling to the bottom of the lock, about 600 sightings were reported where she was placed. In 2005, two students claimed to have found a large tooth embedded in the body of a deer on the lock shore. They publicized the find, setting up a website, but expert analysis soon revealed that the tooth was the antler of a muntjac. The tooth was a publicity stunt to promote a horror novel by Steve Alton, The Lock. In 1933 it was suggested that the creature bears a striking resemblance to the supposedly extinct plesiosaur, a long-necked aquatic reptile that became extinct during the Cretaceous, Paleogene extinction event. A popular explanation at the time, the following arguments have been made against it. In an October 2006 New Scientist article, Why the Loch Ness Monster is no Plesiosaur, Leslie No of the Sedgwick Museum in Cambridge said, the osteology of the neck makes it absolutely certain that the plesiosaur could not lift its head up swan-like out of the water. The lock is only about 10,000 years old, dating to the end of the last ice age. Before then, it was frozen for about 20,000 years. If creatures similar to plesiosaurs lived in Loch Ness they would be seen frequently, since they would have to surface several times a day to breathe 108. In response to these criticisms, Tim Dinsdale, Peter Scott, and Roy McCall postulate a trapped marine creature that evolved from a plesiosaur directly or by convergent evolution. Robert Rines explained that the horns in some sightings function as breathing tubes, or nostrils, allowing it to breathe without breaking the surface. Also new discoveries have shown that plesiosaurs had the ability to swim in fresh waters, but the cold temperatures would make it hard for it to live. The lock being 10,000 years old does have criticism. On the show Monster Quest in a Season 3 episode. Discoveries of a shell that was thought to have been brought up by a seal had been examined to be perfectly intact, and over 10,000 years old suggesting that the lock had connected to the sea allowing marine life, possibly a plesiosaur end up in the lake. There are also theories that the monster or monsters migrate up the River Ness Canal which is used for boats, as the River Ness becomes extremely shallow at points. Another migration route would be through the Fort Augustus Canal which leads to Loch Lochie which can explain why a similar monster called Lizzie has been sighted. R.T. Gould suggested a long-necked nude. Roy McCall examined the possibility, giving it the highest score, 88%, on his list of possible candidates. In 1968 F.W. Holliday proposed that Nessie and other lake monsters, such as Morag, may be a large invertebrate such as a bristle worm, he cited the extinct Tula monstrum as an example of the shape. According to Holiday, this explains the land sightings and the variable back shape, he likened it to the medieval description of dragons as worms. Although this theory was considered by McCall, he found it less convincing than eels, amphibians, or plesiosaurs.